Well, good afternoon, everyone. The people at home who get this DVD never know how happy they are to see this DVD today after what we just went through. <laughs> well, all right, I'm going to start this, DV, this, this sermon today with something you may have heard 15 minutes ago. The Good Samaritan. So, wow, it's the Good Samaritan, when you hear the story of the Good Samaritan, I don't know about you, but it brings me back to my childhood. Now, I'd asked this before. Let me ask again. How many people have heard the story of the Good Samaritan? All right, so... All right, so anybody not heard the story? There's actually one hand of a story that did not hear the Good Samaritan when they were young. Now, that's unusual. Usually when I talk to people, everybody's heard the story of the Good Samaritan. But here's a story you haven't heard yet. America and the Good Samaritan. America and the Good Samaritan. There's a fascinating story that I want to bring to you today that, that you've probably never heard. As I began putting this sermon together, I literally went online and I typed in America and the Good Samaritan. And the answers that came back, they were stereotyped. They were what we have always heard, what we thought we've understood about the Good Samaritan and how that ties into America. But I want to share something with you today and I want to build into the story to show you a deeper meaning of what God's left for us behind this, this parable. So what comes to your mind when you hear the parable of the Good Samaritan? You know, normally you know the story, it's, it's our duty, somebody's in, in need, we're supposed to be able to look and help that individual and do what we can, like the story of the Good Samaritan, and we'll go through the story in just a few minutes. We are conditioned to think in the fashion of what we have learned from our youth. Let me explain that for just a moment. When you hear something in the Bible, your mind goes back into your, your, your memory banks of your past. The information that comes in pulls up an understanding that you have learned from before. What's interesting about the Good Samaritan, it's a narrative that we've learned from a child. And when you think about it, the parables, don't you think of them usually as cute little stories? Pretty much that's what we think about. They're cute little stories. We talk about them in, when they used to in Sunday school. We use them in Sabbath schools today. There's a, there's a depth of the parables that we just have not gotten into of the story that Jesus wants us to understand. So when you hear the Good Samaritan of America in the Good Samaritan, you think about all the good deeds that America has done around the world and how we have, have seen our neighbors, the other nations and people, and how we help pick them up from the roadside and, and give them food and nourishment and clothing and help their nations to, to be restored. We're Good Samaritans as a nation. You think of America and the Good Samaritan. But what if the story is deeper than that? What if there's a specific that God has left for us that he wants us to understand that's for the end time. That could not have been understood 200 years ago or 300 years ago or the, with those at the time of Christ. What if there's something that's more important in that story that we haven't quite understood yet? So let me begin by doing this. Let's, let's take this right from the very basics. What is a parable? What's a parable? It's a narrative. So... Thinking about that today, I'm looking at the news and the politicians today. When they give you a story, they're giving you a narrative of what they want you to see, what they want you to understand. What if the narrative of the, of the parables was something that Satan wanted us to have that's been passed on from generation to generation to generation that's hid the truth? What if? We can look at many of the understandings of Protestant Christianity passed on from, from the Catholic Church to the Protestants down to us from generation to generation that we understand is just not true. But the narrative brings you to a state of mind to accept something. In news stories or in politics, they present a story over and over again to conceal a truth or to substitute an understanding they want you to hear or to give you a false insight of facts. They will give you a narrative. Is in poli The politicians today, if they want you to look a certain way, 
They will feed a narrative out to all the news agencies, and you can turn on, you can flip channel after channel after channel, and you will hear the same story being portrayed over and over and over again through most all the networks. It's because that's the narrative they want you to understand. What if Satan didn't want you to understand a deeper meaning? So he's given us a narrative that we picked up from our youth. And once we think we understand it, we quit looking because it's just a cute little story. It teaches a biblical principle and conceals a deeper meaning. It's, it's called like misdirection. Give them a little bit of truth. They'll think they have it and I can hide the rest because of the narrative we've been given and brought up with. All right. For example, Christianity teaches us that Jesus used the parables to make things plain to understand. That's the narrative of Christianity. I heard that when I was a child. I vivid, in fact, I wrote about it in a newsletter just recently. I vividly remember being in Sunday school at the time, and the teacher asked us, I was real young, why did Jesus speak to them in parables? And she said, so that we can understand things more plainly. But you know what? Years later, I'm in a church, and I'm reading this this. The scripture is, and it says, that's just not what it says. In fact, it says just the opposite. And I was stopped in my tracks. And I'm saying, like, all these years I've been taught that Jesus gave us these parables to make things plain. Here from Jesus' own words, he says, it's not to make things plain, it's to hide things. And I just sat there and I kept staring and I'm thinking, how did I come up with that understanding? How does the churches around the world teach something that is dire? diabolically opposite from what Jesus Christ said. And we just pick it up and we run with it. Because the narrative makes you think you have the truth, so you quit looking. I have seen people look at a scripture and read it and give me an exact opposite meaning of what it just said in plain, in plain light. I'm looking at this like, how can they say that? Has that ever happened to you? And that's happened to me over and over again when I read the Bible and things that I thought I knew, and I'm reading it, and it's like, well, that ain't what the Bible says. All right, so now, going on. So what is a parable? According to Webster, it's a short story that teaches a moral or a spiritual lesson, especially one of the stories told by Jesus and recorded in the Bible. All right, All right. what's a parable? Another definition is this. It's a parable is an allegory or a made-up story to teach a lesson through comparison that when you hear the story, you can, and I left it open. You can what? Well, that's the point. See, Jesus, and I'm going to show you, Jesus has left that open-ended. So it can have, just like in Hebrew, the New Testament is the same way, it has more than one meaning. So that the stories can be true through the centuries. Through the centuries. Here's another question. Why speak in parables? Why speak in parables? Matthew 13, 10 says this, And the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? They were confused also. They wanted to understand, Why do you speak to them in parables? So Jesus' answer provokes numerous contradictions in mainstream Christianity, primarily. Primarily. Christianity teaches that Jesus used them to make things plain to understand. But that's not his answer. So now let's go through that. Let's, a little more reinforcement on the foundation of a parable before we actually get into it. Why speak to them in parables? They were used, there were ways that Jesus used to allow him to convey a message that, one, had multiple meanings. In other words, when he gave that, he gave a simple clear answer that when you read it about the Good Samaritan, you look at the story, and you can obviously see that if someone's hurting, and they're left on the side of a road, and they're bleeding, and they're dying, it's, it's, you just don't walk away from somebody like that. You help that person. That is an obvious meaning we all know. It's basic principle. So when we see that story, we hear that answer, we got it. And we go down the road, that dumb and happy. We know what that's all about. Right? Has multiple meanings. It also reveals truth to only certain people. I'll show you that in just a moment. It reveals truth that would be revealed at specific times. In other words, a parable 
might have the deeper meaning that's meant for an end time that has the significance for that. And the parable I'm going to give you today, as you're going to see, is tied in to that specific reason. And one more. To conceal truth that God doesn't want people to have. Now that's interesting because that creates a problem. That creates a real problem. Let me show you. So parables are given to specify a targeted audience. But I, the, the problem is I thought Jesus is not a respecter of persons. Why would he give something to only him and not him? So you see, it creates a question in theology. Matthew 13 says, And his disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said to them, Because it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Now, I don't know if you realize it, but this information right here is critical to the understanding of God's plan for salvation. Because you see, that statement totally flies in the face of Christianity as it's known today. Because the, the Christianity, what's the narrative? The narrative is he's going out to save all men so that he doesn't lose anybody so they can all go to heaven. But you see, from Jesus' own words, he just said he's not giving the information that he gives to his disciples. He's not giving that to the rest of the world. That alone is, is incredible to understanding what Jesus is teaching. So what does this do? This separates people. See, now that, that concept doesn't seem to fit in Christianity, does it? But it's in his plan. It also creates what appears to be on the surface a contradiction in scriptures. So now when you read something like that, so the ministry would say, well, there's not all things we can't understand. We just have to take it on surface faith value. The question. It says, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. So there's the contradiction. We just read that he's not giving it to everybody, but yet this scripture says he's not a respecter of persons. All right, so now we have, a, we have a problem here, or do we? When you begin to explain something, 1 Corinthians 15, I'm just using this as an example of one, because I don't want to get into all these theologies, but what I'm trying to do is show you that in this parable, there's something that's hidden that's not for everybody. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22 says, For in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then after which those that are Christ at his coming, then comes the end. All right, so we have just created a step process of salvation. Christ first, firstfruits, and then comes the end. If we pull in Revelation 20, it says, But the rest of the dead lived not again till the thousand years were finished. That is another contradiction of theology of mainstream Christianity. You begin talking to people about a second resurrection a thousand years later still on this earth. After Christ returns, it blows out heaven and hell in that theology completely out the water. And not only that, they've never heard of the second resurrection. A physical resurrection. And who are you going to resurrect anyway if by the time of Christ, if they're all in heaven, they all went to the other place, which no one wants to talk about. You ever go to a funeral? Anybody ever preached anybody into to hell? Hadn't been in one of those funerals yet. He wouldn't get invited back to preach another one for that family if he did. <laughs> all right, now, this is just a sidetrack. I had to throw this in, and then we're going to actually get into the parable. I went through that long explanation to show you that certain things we think we understand, we may not know everything, and that God has some things that are hidden. In the story of parables, anybody here, I never, I never heard of this before, ever heard of a chiasmus? Any, any writers in here? A chiasmus. This is amazing. I know I'm going out the wind here, I'm, but I had to bring this to you. And then I'll get into the story because I want to open up your mind to something that we've probably never, ever thought about before. I've heard scripture talk about it's written poetically. It's written in rhyme. It's written in duality. But how about if it's written as a chiasmus? I've never heard of that before. So I'm going to share this with you. 
it's, it's a rhetorical or literary figure in words gram, in grammatical cons, constructions. They're concepts that are repeated in reverse order. So in the same modified form. Or for example, in poetry, it's like the best and happiest moments or the happiest and best in minds. All right, so it's, it's written as if you would write one, two, three, four, five, five, four, three, two, one. See how that, that goes? When Jesus gave the answer about why he wrote in parables, he gave them the answer in a chiasmus. And I said, wow, I've never seen this before. And he wrote it in seven steps. So now this is not a part of why I'm giving you the sermon, but I wanted to take a few minutes to give this to you. So when you get this, I'm, you're not going to be able to write all this down because there's too much here. So when you, when you get the DVD, you can freeze it and go back through it. So let me show you what I'm talking about. He says, therefore, I speak to them in parables, but because seeing they do not see, and while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but you will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but you will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and their ears, they can scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Seven steps of giving an answer to the parable of why he speaks to them in parables, right? Now, a chiasmus now, now I have to reverse the role of what we just gave. This is amazing what Jesus just did, talking to his disciples, boom, just like that. It's like the incredible brilliance of what Jesus does. It just astounds us the more you look at the scripture. So now, we have to take the meaning of each one of these steps now, and we have to reverse them going out. Seven steps. Seven, lest they should see with their eyes. You see here? See, they have closed their eyes, lest they should see with their eyes. You see how that works? Now let's go to the next one. And hear with their ears. And I'm going to go back to these in just a second. And understand with their heart and return, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men a desire to see what you see and did not see, and hear what you hear and did not hear. So it goes boom, boom, boom up, boom, boom, boom down. So now let me put them together to make it a little bit easier to see. All right, so there's the first one. They have closed their eyes lest they see with their eyes. All right, the next one. Number six. With their ears they scarcely hear, and, with, and they hear with their ears. You see now how he's reversed it? The chiasmus in the way it's written. How about five? For this people, has, his uh, heart has become dull and uh, understand with their heart. So now he's working his way back out to number four. They will keep on seeing not perceived. Blessed are your eyes because they see. He goes to number three. You will keep on hearing not understand your ears because they hear. You see how it's just the whole thing. And now we'll go to two. It says, in the case of the prophecy of Isaiah be fulfilled, for truly I say, many prophets and righteous men. So he's reversed them into the prophets. They wanted to, they didn't. Here they want to see it. Then into one. Therefore I speak to them in parables, while seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear. Down on the bottom, they have desired to see what you see. They didn't, you do. Isn't that amazing? Just looking at the scripture, you could have never seen what he just did there. Do you know what that takes to put seven steps in a row and then pull them back out seven steps in a row? That was amazing. When I come across that, it's like, this is absolutely phenomenal. i got to share this. And then I told myself, I said, but that has no place with what we're talking about today. I said, I don't care. i got to share it anyway. That was an argument I had at home one night. It was very late. I was probably delirious. <laughs> but I wanted to share that with you all. So I said, now I said, wow, we need to go look in the rest of the Bible to see how many more of those are hidden in there that we hadn't seen yet. So I named, back to the parables. I just want to throw that out there. Parables are given to a specific targeted audience, Matthew 13. The answer said to them, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. In other words, God has hidden the truth from the rest of the world. 
That's astounding. I mean, that, that alone in the sermon message for uh, a church that has not heard this type of theology, it just totally takes the foundation out of what they preach. But it's, the narrative is the, that he came and made it plain, gives it to everybody so that none should perish. Now, eventually, God's going to give the opportunity that none should perish. That's why it's not contradictive and he's not a respecter of persons. But he does it in a specific order. And that's what's not being taught. The multiple meanings of the parable. So now let me give you uh, some examples, and then we'll go to this parable today. The parable of the lost sheep. We all understand the parable of the lost sheep. And we know that on the top, on the surface, that if someone is, like, is in your midst, is in your church, in your family, and they're, they're straight away, you go get that family member, that church member. We understand that. And, and so you, you think we got it, the understanding, and then we go on. How about the lost coin? Same thing, same principle. You lose it, you, you go try to find it, you know, especially if it's a big coin. How about the prodigal son? So now, whether we realize it or not, these three parables, they're all talking about the same thing. They're talking about Israel. But you see, the churches don't want to teach that. And I'm going to show you the prodigal son. It says, These twelve Jesus sent out, and he commanded them, saying, Do not go to the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter the city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So see, when he began to teach his disciples, he had a specific. Who was he going after? He was going after his son Israel. And the Bible says, my firstborn, who was gone. By the time of Jesus' day, the house of Israel basically did not exist in open. It was gone. It was lost. It was, it was like that coin. And so the story, the story of the parable of the prodigal son is a loving father going after his son, his firstborn, Israel. It's the story of the two houses of the brothers of Israel and the brother Judah who remained connected to God. So when you look at the prodigal son, you know the story. There's the one son stayed there, but his dad. They, he, they, they never basically left and never lost their identity. But the Israel, the house of Israel did. They're gone. Israel lost its inheritance, lost its land. They get taken away captive and they never came back. All right, so basically that's the hidden story behind the uh, prodigal son. The second brother, Israel, lost everything. By the way, why am I tell you, telling you this? Because this is the foundation for the story I'm telling you today of the Good Samaritan. And to know that if every one of those stories there had a deeper meaning, why would we think that the Good Samaritan wouldn't? Why would we think that? So now, let's go into the story of the Good Samaritan and see what it means. So in addition to the obvious meanings, the Good Samaritan is also an end-time story of Israel, the church, and believe it or not, America. Believe it or not, America. So now, let's go through the scriptures and read it first, and then let's go explain what Jesus has in this parable. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and he tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law, and what is, what is your reading of it? I love that. Because you see what Jesus has just done. He threw the question back to the person who asked the question, and he also throws it out to you and I. When you read this story, what did you get out of it? If Jesus was standing before you, what do you read? I love that, when, what Jesus just did there. It's because, you know, people will read it and they'll see different things. And Jesus threw it right back to him. He says, you tell me what is written. In other words, how do you read the law about having eternal life? How do you read it? So he answered and he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now, this is the law you're saying that, by the way. This is a man, highly skilled, highly educated. He knows the scripture. Chances are he has a religious background. The lawyers of the day, chances were, was a Pharisee. We're not told that. 
However, when you see the examples of who he's using in the parable, there's a really good chance he was either a Levite, Pharisee, or he could have been a priest. But it doesn't say a priest, it just says a lawyer. So he said to him, you have answered rightly, do this and you shall live. That should have been, should have went away really happy. So, wow, I get that right. I know, I know the answer for eternal life. He should have went away. You think about this. All right, what do I need to do for eternal life? And he says, okay, you got the answer. Go do that and you're going to live. You should have went away with the happiest guy on the face of the earth. But that wasn't his point. That wasn't why he was talking to Christ. Because you see, he was arrogant in his own belief. Because the first thing says, he stood up to test Jesus. Let me see if this guy knows as much as I do. See, that's what we're being told here. Here's a guy who thought he really, really had his act together. Going on, verse 20 in the scripture. But he wanted to justify himself, he says. So he says this, who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus could have very easily said, well, you just gave me the answer, you tell me. See, he, because he was in an area, there were probably people around Jesus because it says he ate with sinners. He was around the Samaritan people. He's around prostitutes and harlots. I mean, this guy even ate with tax collectors. So he says, who is my neighbor then? But he just gave him the answer. Who is neighbor. He says, your neighbor. But he wanted to separate this, this thing with the neighbor. So remember now, it was the lawyer who said, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Jesus says. How do you read it? No, he had a very limited scope of who his neighbor was. But he knew what Jesus did did not fit into his scope of a neighbor. That's why he said, who is my neighbor then? Because he knew what Jesus was doing didn't fit with his meaning of theology. So following the lawyer's response, Jesus uses it now to teach us a lesson. The parable begins in verse 30 now. So Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by the other side. Likewise, a Levite. When he arrived at that place, he came and looked, and he also passed by the other side. Be like a policeman today going down the street and he'll see a fight going on or a shooting going on and he just kind of turns his head the other way and just goes on. All right, to give you, give you an idea what's, what the example he's given us here. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was and when he saw him, he had compassion. And so he went with him, he bandaged up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal. He brought him to an inn and he took care of him. On the next day, he departed, and he took out two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, when I, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. All right, so there's our parable. So now, Jesus goes back to the lawyer. He gives him the parable. So which of these do you think was the neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? Because he asked, Who's my neighbor? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. He could not even say the Samaritan. It was the guy who showed mercy. Right? Why didn't he just say it was the Samaritan? It would have been a lot easier. It was the guy who showed mercy. Then Jesus said, go and do likewise. Now he's got a problem. And willing to justify himself, he has to agree that Samaritans, which I won't go into detail here, they were hated by the Jews of the day. All right? They were hated by the Jews of the day. The Good Samaritan now. So what do we know? What do we just read and go through? All right, so let's now let's dissect this, this parable. We do know that the person Jesus was speaking to was a lawyer. We know that there was a priest in the parable. There was also a Levite in the parable. There's a Samaritan in the parable. And what story would be complete without a donkey? <laughs> right? What story would be complete without a donkey? There's also a journey that's involved. 
So what are we not told? We're not told about who the man is lying on the road. We have no idea who the man is on the, on the road, is there? All right, so now let's go see if we can put this together. The person Jesus is speaking to was a lawyer. Let's take that first. Let's cover the obvious. Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. The lawyers of the day were normally Levites. They were the educated class. They were normally the ones who would set apart and understand the law. And they were the keepers of justice at the time. All right? Because of his position, he might also have been a Pharisee because he was very skilled in, in the, uh, the Scripture. Because he was coming to the teacher to try to, to, to take the teacher and show him that the teacher didn't know what he was talking about. In other words, he had to be pretty confident he knew the Scripture. So the chances are he might also have been a Pharisee, which again was, was the keepers of the law. The Pharisees felt they were superior or better than common Jewish people and looked down on them. They were very haughty and arrogant men who took great pride in their education and secular achievements. So both John the Baptist and Jesus condemned them for being wicked because they amassed great wealth and power and served themselves rather than serving the needs of the people, making sure they received justice. So in the parable, there is a dig toward his background of the lawyer showing that what you are doing is counter to what you have just answered for eternal life. All right, so it basically is beginning to throw back into, into his understanding what he's facing. So now, right, that's, that's the background to a lawyer. There's also a priest and a Levite. All right? A priest and a Levite, basically, we covered. We know who the priests were. They were the ones who carried the services and the Sabbath services, and they, they kept all the holy days. And to be a priest, you had to be a Levite. But a Levite didn't have to be a priest. They could have been a lawyer or anything else. All right, so here what we have is we have those two, the priest that came down the road, and we have the Levite that passes by, both of them on the other side. Jesus used the example of the caretakers of their society of the time. In other words, if there was something that was out of place in that society that wasn't right, you would normally have the Levites and the priest to help take care of that sick person or to bring about justice. Today, if we would use it in terms today, we would be talking about the civil authority of the land and church leaders. All right, so if you see, you would see you know, a, a pastor or a priest walking down the road and there's somebody there laying there bleeding, he would go on the other side so that he wouldn't get involved. Or like I used the example of a policeman turning his head the other way. So that's what he's given. He's given them things that he understands of how things worked in the society at that day. So in other words, he's bringing it to life. He's bringing it home to that man right where he lives. So what else do we have? We have a Samaritan. Uh, so the Samaritans, what's quite interesting is the Samaritan were actually a part of Israel. Uh, most of them were, were from Benjaminites. And part of the tribe of ben Benjamin was brought forward into uh, Israel, into Judah. I'm sorry, when Judah came back out of captivity, many of the Benjaminite tribes were, were merged with Judah. In fact, today, even to today, you have many of the, like Benjamin Netanyahu. Right? You have a lot of the Benjamin tribes were warriors, they were people, but they had gotten to a point that they were hated. Um, let me read something here. No, I'm gonna, I'll save this for later about, uh, about the Samaritans. I'll bring that up later. The Samaritan. There was a hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans that goes back hundreds of years even before Christ. They were hated and rejected of the Jews. 2 Kings 17 is the background to the Samaritans. So I, I'll read that now. Just, I don't want to cover the whole chapter, but I want to bring out just a couple of things because I'm going to show you how that merged from that day, how Christianity today does the same thing. So in 2 Kings uh, chapter 17, uh, verse uh, 26, I'm going to read from there. It says, Wherefore, speak to the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which you have removed and placed in the cities of Samaria do not know the manner of God in the land. Therefore, he sent lions among them, and behold, they slayed them, because they didn't know the manner of God in the land. So when Israel was taken captivity, what happened was they tried to repopulate the land of Israel. But because they didn't follow God the way they were supposed to, those who went to populate the land were being destroyed. In other words, God was protecting the land. He was sending lions, was killing all these people. 
So wow, that's an interesting story. So then the king of Assyria commanded him, saying, Well, carry here one of the priests from, whom you, from there, and let him go and he dwell there and teach them what manner of God in the land. So in other words, I'm, I'm going to send more people down there, but this time take a priest with you and let him, the priest, teach those people how to live in that land so they don't keep getting destroyed. So verse 28, So then one of the priests whom they carried away to, from Samaria came and dwelt in Bethel and taught them how they should fear God. This is quite interesting because in Christianity, what they did, the same thing. They would go into the, to the lands of the pagans and they would try to get the pagans to live according to God's ways. By the way, that's how we came to Sunday worship. Because of worshiping Sunday. It followed the exact same path that I'm reading here in Kings. In verse 29, Howbeit every nation made gods of their own and put them in houses of high places which the Samaritans had made. And every nation in the cities wherein they dwelt. And going on, and so verse 32, So they feared the Lord and made unto themselves of the lowest of them the priests in high places who sacrificed in the houses of the high places. In verse 33, And they feared the Lord and they served their own gods after the manner of the nations who carried them away. So what, what are we looking at? They went in to repopulate, resettle, teach them how to live. So they went in, learned what the Israelites were doing, then they brought in their own gods and they substituted their religion for what the Israelites did. So today when you look at the Bible, you look at Christianity today, you cannot get what the churches in the world teach today out of that Bible. can't be done. It just can't be done unless you have changed what they did just like with the Samaritans. Coming out of captivity, the Samaritans brought forth the false pagan worship that was given to them way back that we read about just now in 2 Kings. And so they were looked at as heretics. Right? They looked at as heretics. By the way, I looked at uh, today, they're still, they're still around today. In the last census, they said there were 777 of them still around. So, wow, that's kind of interesting. 777 of actual ones that can trace their heritage back. So I don't know if that's true or not, but I thought the 777 was kind of ironic. Versus the 666. So just, just interesting. So here we have, just like with Christ now, so the Samaritans were hated and rejected. So now we have a Samaritan that seems to fit the bill of Jesus Christ. It says he was despised and rejected of men. So are the Samaritans. So who's rejected? Who's coming down the road? It's the Samaritan who helps. And by the way, Christ rode in on a donkey, right? There is a donkey in this story. So the Samaritan who comes down, he says, put him on my donkey. All right, so, so what Christ has given us now is, is someone who is despised and rejected of his own people. Who's given the, the, the one who needs help, gets off his donkey, gives it to this person who needs the help and brings him to the end. By the way, when Christ came the first time, what did he do? He gave us a deposit, the Holy Spirit, to carry us through picks us up, picks off the road, puts us on the donkey, so to speak, and brings us forward carrying with the Holy Spirit. And he says, by the way, when I come back, I'm going to finish the bill. All right, so we'll come back with full, we become spirit beings with him. So you begin to put the story together is that he's taken a theology and an understanding of things that have been, bringing it now closer to him, taking himself and putting it in the role of Samaritan as hated and rejected just like Isaiah says. All right, now, so now we have the donkey. All right, so we talked about the donkey already. So now we have three things left. All right, so we know that there's, there's also a journey. There's also a man lying on the side of the road. And by the way, I, I held out. Let's see where it's at. I held out on you because you see there's one more thing that's not been told. Did you get which one it was in the story? What else we haven't covered yet? There's one more aspect of this story that we haven't covered yet. Who are the thieves? See how easy we can get sidetracked? There's another player here. Who, is, who are the thieves? All right, so now let's look at what we have left. And now let's begin deciphering the parable. So now we're going to learn... What's, what's not known 
who are the thieves on the road, and who is the man lying on the side, by what we do know, the journey. What do we know about the journey? All right, let's, let's start there. Jesus left us a parable that ties us to actual events of the Old Testament and leads us to the understanding that he wants us to understand for the future. Jericho. All right, so the story was they were to take a journey from, from where? From Jerusalem to Jericho. In the Old Testament for ancient Israel, Jericho was the gate, gateway into the promised land. Gate, Jericho was the gateway into the promised land. They would cross, they cross the Jordan, remember? And then they would, the first city there in that nation was Jericho. So they had to go up to Jericho. If they're going to get into the promised land, they had to go through Jericho. In the New Testament, when Christ gave the parable, Jericho was, loaded, was located in the northern tribes of the lost tribes of Israel. So here I put this specific map up because you see here we have this was Judah and this was in, uh, Israel and that's Benjamin right, on the northern, the northern side of Judah, which is actually a part of the Samaritans. So Jesus is telling them you're going you're gonna to go from Jerusalem to Jericho. But it's interesting when you read it, it says you've got to go down to Jericho. Jericho is north of Jerusalem. They're not going down. So when he says that, he's speaking in, in uh, altitude. In other words, the, the height of where Jerusalem and the city was, and Jericho was on a lower plane, even though it was going further north. So let's look at that. On the road to Jericho, the Good Samaritan Inn. All right, this is another little left turn. I'm just throwing this out so you'll get a chance to go back and look for something. I didn't know this place when I began doing this, this uh, study. I didn't realize this place existed. But on the border between the, where they believe with the two nations, the borders were between, between Judah and Israel, there's an inn called the Good Samaritan Inn. It's a big thing over there. I didn't realize how big it was. And, and at that inn, there's an archaeological dig going on. And then they bring all the archaeological artifacts to that museum. So you can go there, you can stay, and you can go look at the museum and, and all the study. It's actually on the border where they believe the, the uh, uh, Judah and Israel was. I said, well, that's pretty fascinating. So that, again, has nothing to do with our story, but I thought it was fascinating, so I just threw it in. All right, so now what are we looking at? Here we go. He's going to go through to Jericho from Jerusalem. So Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, departed, and he left him half dead. Sounds like the story of Israel to me. All right? The story of Israel. Why? Because Israel doesn't exist. It's been left half dead. It was taken captive. But it's still there when we look at the New Testament. So the story that we're giving here now is going to be a continuation of the story that began with Israel in the past. Who did Jesus send from Jerusalem? Who did Jesus send from Jerusalem? Jesus sent the church, the spiritual Israelites. When he, when he said in Matthew, he says, Go ye therefore, who was he sending? It was those who is going to be given the Spirit of God. And we understand through the Spirit, the circumcision of, of the heart, that we become spiritual Israelites. So we're still talking about the same thing. We're talking about the church and we're talking about Israel. You're still talking about the same thing, the physical Israel, the spiritual Israel. It's the same story. Where's Jericho? Jericho's, Jericho's the gateway to the promised land. Where are the spiritual Israelites going? To the millennial reign. It's the same thing. That's a promised land. Look what it says in Acts verse 1. You will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, by the way, this is the way that the gospel began to be preached. This is actually a prophecy. This is just not a platitude. It's a prophecy. Let me, look, let me show you something. In Acts chapter 8, that when Jesus died, the word spread around Jerusalem and Judea, all the land about Jesus, because he was seen of those 40 days, remember? So it went through all Judea, but they couldn't go to Samaria yet because they were told not to. But when they received the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in Acts 8, following the persecution of the church in verse 4, it says, 
Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word, and Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. So when you read this in Acts 1, Judea and Samaria, and then to the other ends of the earth, that is going to Jericho. It is started in Jew Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then it has been going on to the ends of to, to Jericho. We're not there yet, are we? So now let's go through the story. What are we looking at? So what are we looking at through all of this? All right. What are we looking at? Who is the parable meant for? The parable is actually a duality of Israel. In the Old Testament, the Israelites was the church in the wilderness. Acts 7, verse 38 says this. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness. So we actually have a scripture that actually calls ancient Israel the nation, the church. So when we talk about the New Testament, the church, the spiritual church of, the, uh, of Israel, the, the, the nation of promise, we're talking about the same thing. It hasn't changed. The plan of God has not altered. It's just moved to, from the old covenant to a new covenant. All right, so going on. Where are they going? In the Old Testament, they're going to the promised land. In the New Testament, they're going to the kingdom. Same story. It's the trip. There's only one group that he sent from Jerusalem. It's interesting the parable says go to Jericho. So why did he say Jericho? Because it was the gateway to the promised land. What was the gateway into the promised land in the Old Testament? We know that. It was Jericho. No doubt about it. In the New Testament today, the parable says the person was sent out from Jerusalem to Jericho. So if this is true, what I'm telling you, and it is, where is Jericho today? What is the land of Jericho today? Where is it at? Where is the gateway to the millennium today? All right, let's talk about that. The gateway to the millennium, 2 Samuel verse 7, chapter 7, verse 10. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. For Israel to have a place of its own in the promised land, they had to go through Jericho to have their own place. Now, by the way, when this scripture was given, it was given to King David. They were in the promised land. They had been in the promised land for a long time. They went through the judges. They went through, they went through, uh, through Joshua, the kings. They're into the, King David now is being given this information. They're already in the promised land. But here the scripture says, Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. Who is he talking to? He's talking about the people on the side of that road who were left there for dead so that when he came, he picked them up. He gave him a down payment. He took care of him. He put him on his donkey. He brought him to the end. He says, when I come back, I want to see him healthy and whole. And I'm going to finish the payment when I get back. So he's talking about the same people. But the story picks up through the spiritual analogy of those called out ones who receive the Holy Spirit, who are spiritual Israelites. And he says he's going to move them to a land again. Because you see, that land they were in wasn't the land of promise totally that was given to them from, from uh, their ancestry. When God said this, Israel was already in the land of promise. You need to remember that. And the people who talk about that today, they don't understand that what God was talking about isn't that small piece of land they call Israel today. That's Judah. The land of Israel, the lost ten tribes, that God says, I was going to move them to the land of promise. When you look at the land of promise in Genesis 49, I don't know if I brought the scriptures in here. Yeah, I do have them. What nation fills the bill of the promises in Genesis? In Genesis 49, it says, Joseph is a fruitful bow, even a bow oh, by a well whose branches overrun the wall. Archers have sorely grieved him and shot him and hated him. But his bow and his strength of his arms and his hands were made strong by the hands of Almighty God Jacob. It says, even by the God of the Father who shall, shall help you and the Almighty God who shall bless you with blessings above heaven, a blessings in the deep that lies under, blessings in the breast, blessings in the womb, and blessings of your Father that have prevailed above the blessings of the progenitors unto the utmost bound of the everlasting hills. We're talking about blessings that surpassed any other nation that ever existed. 
there is only one nation that fits that bill, America. And its brother, Great Britain, is. There's something else it has to have. Now, you can see also in Deuteronomy uh, 33, it, it goes even, even uh, more and more about the blessings. This is when, when uh, Moses rec was recounting the story to the Israelites, the second generation before they went into the promised land. He goes through the blessings there. It says, precious fruits brought forth by the sun, precious things by the moon, the chief things, the ancient mountains, the precious things of everlasting hills, the precious things of the earth and its fullness. And it just goes on and on and on with the blessings. So now, one more thing it has to have. Remember now, we're talking about the Israelites in a parable. That nation that fits that description of the blessings must also carry the name of Israel. If this is true, it also has to carry the name of Israel. In Genesis 48, verse 15 through 16, Jacob, the story is given to Jacob and the blessings upon Joseph's son, says this. God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has fed me, all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil beasts, bless the lads and let my name be upon them. The ones who have the blessings of what I just read from Genesis 49 and in Deuteronomy. This is Jacob, the one who is Israel. He's saying that he put it on his grandsons and says, my name will be on them. The story we're talking about of Israel going into the promised land is America going to the promised land. It's through the promised land. America is the gateway. You realize that? The gateway. Let's look at it another way. Let me ask the question this way. Where is the last stop to proclaim the coming of Jesus Christ before the promised land or before the millennial reign? When we look at history, we went through it in detail in, in the rise of the, the Holy Roman Empire, how God took the children of Israel and he began from Jerusalem to bring them to Jericho. They went through around the Mediterranean Sea and into Europe, and they were supplanted from Europe all the way over across the waters, the burrow that, that went overseas into America. It was the last warning stop before Christ returns. When the children of Israel reached the Jordan, what did, they were in sight of Jericho. What did Jericho see? They saw Israel coming. They knew and they were terrified. All right, so we, let me show you now why I believe America is the gateway to the millennium. When they went to the promised land, Joshua 1 verse 11 says this, Pass through the camp, and command the children, the people, saying, Prepare provisions for yourselves, for within three days you will cross over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you. God's warning message was carried on through his church that he said, Will not perish. To bring us to the gateway, we cannot cross the Jordan to what happens first, till Christ comes back. The Israelites were camped on the other side of the Jordan until, God says, be ready now, in three days. The children were to wait for the ark to go first, and they were to follow it because, Joshua 3, 4 says this, that you may know the way by which you must go, for you have not passed this way before. God's commission given to his church is to go ye therefore unto all the earth to proclaim the warning message that Jesus Christ is coming back. He is that Samaritan who sat, when he took that donkey, sat the Israelite on his donkey and brought him to the end and says, I will be back to finish the job and I will take care of it. You go to Jericho. You go to the gateway into the promised land, but you can't get there until I come. When I come back, I will finish the job. Israel could not cross the Jordan till the ark went first. Why? Because they had never been that way before. You and I cannot go into eternity until Jesus Christ comes back and opens that door and allows us to go through that gateway into the promised land for the millennial reign. 
the Good Samaritan. Jericho knew the warnings from God. Jericho knew when they came through, they saw that Jordan dry up. When you read the stories, the kings of those nations said their hearts melted. They, they, because they remembered 40 years ago what God did to Egypt, who was the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. Look what Joshua 2 verse 11 says. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted, and neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Who is saying this? It's Rahab. That was Rahab, rejected and despised of her own people. The type of the person laying on the side of the road. So now, this is interesting. And, 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 I, and I'm going to cover this a lot more when I go. To, hopefully I get to it this fall. Because the, like the series I just gave on the Exodus, the fall holy days have the same duality and meaning, which is multi-layered with lots and lots of information. Here's the point. At any time, Jericho, who saw the Israelites coming across that spring, that, that river, saw the river open up and the Israelites camped. They shut the doors and they were encamped and they were scared. Nobody went in, nobody went out. All they had to do was repent. That's all it would have took. All they had to do was repent. And it would have been over. And God would have allowed them to live. So, at any point in time, America could also repent. So here's the sad part of the whole story. And I believe this is why God's given it the understanding to this parable today. Is God destroyed Jericho when he moved into the promised land? Unless America repents of its ways, it too will receive the same fate. When I put this together, I feel part of the reason I feel so driven to do end time messages, warning messages, is that when I look at Jericho, and this is some of the things that I'll go into in this next series that I hope to get to this fall, every single person in that city knew Israel was at their doorstep, that God was coming back. It was going to move into that promised land. There was no doubt in anyone's minds. That duality must hold true for this nation. That means the warning message to this generation must go out. That God's coming back and it needs to repent if we're ever going to cross into the promised land. God has given you and I that job in all of God's churches. And I think we need to work harder than ever before. Because when I look at what's going on, when I look at the, at the, 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 the politicians today, the, the news today, the, the, the anger today, the, the murders, the killings, the loss of any civility of, of God's way, I don't think we have much time. You know, I honestly thought months and months ago, I said, well, I watched the way the Republicans was moving and I watched the way the Democrats were moving. I said, well, maybe God's going to give us more time. But I'm going to tell you something. I watched both, both campaigns. And when I saw those at the Republican Party all stand up and cheer for the gay movement, they gave in to the last vesture of hope for me. God says he hates that. He hates it. He's going to destroy this world. He says because it's going to be like Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't know who's going to get in, but at this point, I don't think it makes any difference. I think God's given us that warning message right now. I think our place in time is this. I think we're on the other side of the Jordan. But I think Jericho can see us. And I think it's time that we make the move to get out and make that warning with everything that's in our power. I hope you'll take this and help share that with your friends, share it with anybody in the church. Let them know how important 
the message of warning has got to be. This message of the Good Samaritan, I don't believe has ever been told this way before. Every piece of that puzzle falls in place. I'm not saying it's the first time here. I mean, I know people, a lot of people do a lot of things. I have not seen it this way before. And I believe it's because we are running out of time. That I think this message is for God's people. That it's high time we get on fire to begin to preach that warning message to let them know that Jesus Christ is on his way back. I don't think we have a lot of time. I wouldn't saddle yourself down with a lot of debt. I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend a lot of time wasted energy. I would focus your future on crossing that Jordan. Because you see, I think we're at the gateway to the promised land.